Good morning and welcome to this morning's service here at Basingstoke Baptist Church. My name is Sue Gale and I'm here to host this morning's service. We extend a very warm welcome to those of you who are able to be here in person and also those of our visitors who are joining us online. We particularly welcome any newcomers who have joined us today. We hope you really enjoy our service this morning. Dave, our usual minister, and his wife Carol are away this weekend for a well-earned break. So this morning we also welcome David Grant, who is joining us uh, from Hook, um, but also attends the Gateway Church in Basingstoke. Uh, he will be speaking to us later on in the service. So thank you, David. We always really enjoy your visits to us, and we look forward to the message you'll be sharing with us later on today. I've been thinking a lot this week about gratitude and thankfulness and the power of being thankful. It can transform our outlook and our expectations. It helps to be reminded that you and I are very precious to God. We are precious in his eyes and he loves us. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. Gerard Hughes, in one of his excellent books, suggests a helpful spiritual exercise. When you get to the end of a day, instead of casting your mind over the mishaps and problems of the day, deliberately think back over the good moments of the day. Think of the moments you've enjoyed. Relish and appreciate them no matter how trivial they seem. He describes these moments as actually God's gift to us. He goes on to say, and I quote from his words, it is only by looking at and appreciating and relishing such moments in our lives that we can come to any real notion of God's goodness. So can I encourage you now as we turn to worship to dwell on the good things that have happened this week However small, let's worship.
Oh, good morning. Do you please take your seats? I'd like to invite the children, if they'd like to, to come to the front. Mums and carers, mums and dads and carers, if uh, you don't want your children to appear on the, on the video, then please keep them with you. But if you'd like to come and sit at the front here, and uh, I'm going to share some things with the children. That's it. Sit on, just sit on the floor so I can see your face, that's it. And then you can see me. <laughs> Very kind of you to come and sit next to me. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Well, I was introduced, my name is Dave, um, and you can call me Dave, that's fine. And um, from my day job, I'm a hospital chaplain. Does anyone know what a hospital chaplain is? Any ideas? No? Okay, I'll explain what a hospital chaplain is then. So it's a bit like, Dave here is your minister, isn't he? And he, he looks after the church and cares for the people in it, and he, and he preaches on a Sunday and generally leads the church. Well, a hospital chaplain is similar. They're a minister, but my, cha- my church really is the whole of the hospital. So that's all the people in the hospital who are sick and all of the people who work in the hospital. Um, I don't do it on my own because that's a very big church to look after. Uh, there's several of us who do it. But we, we go around the hospital and we visit people and we uh, visit the people who are sick in beds and we visit um, staff who are working in the offices and the doctors and nurses and we're there to help them and support them. Um, and try and bring them encouragement and just generally um, make their day a little bit brighter. And I spend a lot of time listening to people telling me what their problems are. Obviously, it's confidential, so I can't tell you what their problems are, but you can imagine the kind of things that, that people might be going through, problems in their families maybe, maybe stress from their work, maybe they're, they're, they're not coping very well with being very ill because that makes us sad, doesn't it? And sometimes those illnesses, actually people are dying, and I talk to those people as well. And one of my great privileges is that sometimes, not all the time because not everyone wants me to, but sometimes I get to pray with these people and just ask God to come and be with them, pray for them to get better, pray for them to know God's peace and God's comfort while they're ill. Now, I want to show you a little video um, which talks about the time when Jesus went to visit someone who was sick. And then I just want to say a few things that I think we might learn from that story. So if we can roll the video, please. Can you all see it? After Jesus left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he stood over her, commanded the fever, and it left her. Immediately, she got up and began to serve them. As the sun was setting, all those who had any relatives sick with various diseases brought them to Jesus. He placed his hands on every one of them and healed them. Demons also came out of many, crying out, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. The next morning Jesus departed and went to a deserted place. Yet the crowds were seeking him and they came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But Jesus said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns too, for that is what I was sent to do. Okay, so can anyone tell me what you think we might learn from that story? Yep, nice and loud. Um, what we learned from this story is that um, God can heal you if, if, even though you have like, a really bad disease, He can heal you. Excellent, that's right. We learned from that story that God can heal us even though we have a really bad sickness. There's two things that I want to, to, to learn from this. One other thing that um, comes perhaps before that is for us to recognize that Jesus loves. Um, us and he loves his friends. He loved Peter also. He's called Simon in the story but we know him as Simon Peter or Peter. Jesus later gave him the name Peter. And, so, and Jesus loved Simon because he was one of his friends and he also loved Simon Peter's mother-in-law because he, she was part of Simon's family. And Jesus went to Simon's house and when he was there he went up and laid hands on his mother-in-law and prayed for her and she got well. In fact she got well. The fever is a very serious illness but um, She got so well, actually, she got straight up and started providing food for them and serving them and just looking after them, looking after Jesus. But the second thing, and you you made this point absolutely great, um, 
when the people heard what had happened and knew that Jesus was there, all the people from the surrounding area came and the great crowds of people brought people to Jesus. And Jesus laid hands on them and he healed them. He healed them of their sicknesses and their diseases. He even drove out demons from many of them as well. And absolutely, Jesus is able to heal then and he's able to heal now. And so what I want to encourage you today as you go um, to your groups later and as you go home from here later in, into next week is to remember... First of all, that Jesus loves you, and he loves all the people that you love. He loves your family, he loves your friends, he loves your teachers at school, all the people you care about and concerned about. Um, he loves those people as well. And if you or any one of those people that you love and care about get sick, then you can pray to Jesus and expect that he will make a difference. I've prayed for people and have seen people get better straight away, but sometimes it takes a bit longer, and sometimes it also needs people to have medicine or have surgery in the hospital. But what I do find is whether or not someone gets better straight away, whenever I offer to pray for someone and do pray for them, they always appreciate it. So I'd encourage you to, to think about uh, next time you're sick or someone you know is sick, just being willing to pray for them and expect that God will make a big difference in their life. Okay? Do you think you can do that? Yes. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you for listening. Do please go back and find your parents and your carers and uh, we'll move on to the next part of our service. Let us pray. 
God, thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that we know that you are good and you are mighty, that everything that you've done is the, is the, is the greatest goodness that we could ever ask for and, the, and has overcome the biggest obstacles in, cre in creation, in the, in the universe. And thank you that you carry on doing all of, all of these wonders that you can always be doing and will always be doing more that we can ever ask for and that we can ever imagine. Thank you that we can get that we can gather here today and thank you that we can indeed just gather to to praise you and to celebrate you. Um, but I also pray that you will be with us whenever we go out from this place as well or if we're wherever we are in whatever context we are and pray that we can spread news of you and your love wherever wherever we find ourselves i thank uh, i thank you so much for the work of um for the work of everyone like hospital chaplains or town chaplains or street pastors or any of the other ministries that um that your people um that your people do to spread the word to people um to people and to bring your comfort and your love to others wherever they find wherever they find themselves in whatever situation and i ask that you would bring comfort to those who are facing are facing that um, that hardship and that um, and times of trial and let them know that you have their have their best interests um, at at heart and that you will uh, have plans that are intended to prosper them and not harm them I thank you that uh, matt we matt wise's tumor has become stable I thank you so much that that family can um, can celebrate and 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 can t and can have um, have some have some have some comfort. I just pray that you would bless Matt Tiff and the Matt Tiff and the girls as as they um, le as they lead up to, um, to to Christmas, and that they can carry on praising your name even in this in the in the in their situation. And I also pray that for um, for Chloe, Sarah Bond's daughter, who is currently under undergoing chemotherapy, I pray that you would be with them. Um, with um, with the whole with the whole Bond family, with um, Chloe and her husband Connor particularly, um, as they go, as they go through the, through this time, comfort them in in that place and let them know that you are that you are with them always. And I pray that you would let anyone who is in that situation know that you're with them. Draw close, I pray, God, and and just let your presence felt and let your love be felt and let them know that you um, let them know that. You will not let any um, any harm, any greater harm, come to them than um, the, uh, than than you can. Uh, that you that you have the power over that over those situations, and that you are and that you are greater than everything that that this that this world can bring. I also thank the, um, thank you for the work of the Samaritan's Purse charity that is starting the Operation Christmas Child Appeal. Um, I just thank you so much for all of the other programs that they do through, um, throughout the year. Um, I thank you particularly for the um, for the work programs that they ha um, that they have in Africa to um, to allow people to allow people to get um, to develop develop skills and make sustainable futures for themselves, both um, both in this world and and with you. I thank you for the work, uh, the disaster relief work they've done in Afghanistan and in, in Indonesia, the Bahamas, Germany, and around, around the world. That I thank you that this charity is not just the shoeboxes, but is just, um, but is just so much more. And I pray that you would give them whatever means that um, that they that they need to um, to lift more people up, more people out of poverty, to continue providing to, um, providing to others, to give your love. And the and provide for the need, and provide for the needs of the the communities that they all serve. Give them uh, the wisdom to know what um, what to do to ameliorate those situations, rather than just sending um, just sending aid that is that is something that is done once and then um, doesn't doesn't address the situation. I just bl um, also bless the work of this church um, as uh, as we reach out into this this community that you would help us um, to help all who, um, 
all who come here um, and all that are served by the people in this place to feel welcome and have their needs met and to, and to come to know you that we would be able to cater both for the spiritual needs of everyone and the physical needs of everyone who comes through our doors. And I pray that you would help us to, um, to show your love to everyone around us that they may see through the works that we do and the love that we show that you are God, you are mighty and that they may come to praise your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And, yeah. and if the young people could now leave to, um, could, could now leave to the back to um, go to, go to their groups as well. Thank you. of my enemy I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar Up from the ashes Home will arise Death is defeat, the key is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. See, you've lost your hold on me. Praises roar up from the ashes. Home will arise. Death is defeat. The key is alive. We sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder.
joy and privilege to, to come here. Whenever Dave uh, asks me to come and speak, I always have a look at my diary and see if I'm available, and if I'm not, see what I can do to make myself available, because it's such a joy and a privilege to be here with you. Um, I don't know if you've experienced something like this, but if sometimes if I'm, a, I'm in a busy place, maybe at a football match or an airport, or, or last, a couple of weekends back we took my granddaughters up to London and we went on the train and we went to visit the, uh, the Natural History Museum. And there were lots of people around. I mean, even of, despite COVID, there were lots of people around. And, and you can feel quite small and insignificant. You can feel like you're the only person in that space. And sometimes I'll look at people and just think, wow, there's all these people busy going about their lives. I know nothing about that person sat opposite me on the train or, or the person next to me in the football stadium. I wonder what, what their life is about and what they do. And, and that can connect us with people, but it can also make us feel quite insignificant and unimportant. And I want to introduce the message I'm going to bring this morning by showing a short video which introduces Psalm 139. And I hope um, will give you just a little bit of a hook to get us into this psalm. So let's watch this video together. The world is a big place. There's a lot of people here from every country, every ethnicity, and every language. In fact, if everyone on earth got in a single line, a single queue giving each person 12 inches of space, that line would stretch around the world 18 times and then it would go to the moon and back again twice if you stood at the front of that line and every person walking forward told you their name at a rate of one a second 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year it would take over 200 years for you to hear everyone's name. It's easy to feel small in the crowd. It's easy to feel alone. Easy to feel lost. Easy to feel unknown. David reflected on this in the book of Psalms in chapter 139. He says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Seven billion people. It would take you 200 years to hear everyone's name. But God says he knows you. Out of the line that stretches around the world 18 times into the moon and back twice, God knows you. He doesn't just know your name, 
He knows everything about you. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. You are not unknown. You are not unloved. God knows who you are. He knows your name. And he loves you. It's quite a mind-blowing way to think about how God knows us intimately and, and well. We, we know the people in our family really well, don't we? We know maybe the people in our church or in our workplace not so well, but we, we do over time get to know them. But there are millions, billions of people, seven billion people live on this planet, and we know a tiny, tiny fraction of those. But God knows every single one of us, every single person, not just their name, not as a, an, an anonymous number, but he knows them intimately. He knows everything about them. I mentioned with the children that I work as a hospital chaplain three days a week. Um, and very often I'll read the psalm at the bedside of someone. Um, and I find time and time again, well, with both the people who are believers and also actually there are some people who, who don't have a faith as we understand it. They have just some kind of spiritual um, awareness within themselves and I say would you like me to read a psalm would you like me to pray and I read the psalm to them and so often they just look at me and say wow that just explains completely where I am and how I feel and they feel significant and feel connected and so I want this morning to take a few minutes just to unpack this psalm for you I'm sure it's familiar to many there'll be verses and parts of the psalm which you will know extremely well but I just believe this morning it'd be good for us to, to dig into this maybe a little bit deeper um, on its own, actually, it is powerful. I think just hearing the words on their own is awesome. But I, I, just my prayer is that as we look at this together, maybe God will just um, draw back the curtains a little bit and you'll be able to grasp more completely how much he knows you, how much he loves you. So let's look at it. If you have a Bible with you, please turn to it or switch it on. I'll trust you that you're doing that and not playing a game. Um, and we'll read these words together. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. If I, um, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. As I say, these are words which I guess are familiar to many of you, and words which bring great comfort to many people. I want to break up the message this morning into four parts. 
Um, there's four sections um, in the NIV translation of the Bible. Uh, the first section, uh, verses 1 to 6, we can look here and see how God knows us intimately and we can't deceive him. In the second section, verses 7 to 12, we can think about how that God is with us constantly, but we can't escape him. The third section, God made us wonderfully, we can't ignore him. And the fourth section, the final section, God judges righteously, we cannot dispute him. What we think about God and our relationship to him determines what we think about everything else. What we think about other people, what we think about the universe, what we think about God's word, what we think about God's will, what we think about sin, faith, obedience. All of these things are shaped by what we think about God. But also what shapes us is what we think that God thinks about us. I have a, a coaster beside my bed that says, I cannot afford to have any thoughts about myself that God doesn't have about me. And it was Bill Johnson from Bethel Church in California who, who wrote those words. I cannot afford to have any thoughts about myself that God doesn't have about me. And, and often when we are struggling, it's because our thoughts don't, about ourselves don't align up with God's thought about ourselves. How many people struggle with a sense of, of self-loathing, even self-hatred, who, who don't feel comfortable in their own skin and don't feel that they are, are worth anything? Well, I hope this morning that we'll just be able to, to just pare that away and for you to understand that God loves you. This may seem a strange thing to say, but God doesn't just love you, he likes you. Okay, now you might think, well surely love is stronger than like, but actually um, that sometimes we, we do show love towards people even though we don't like them. But this morning I want you to understand that God really does like you. You are not an accident. All, all of the things that you perhaps would like to change about yourself, all the things you carry, the, the hurt perhaps, the, the scars of pain that's been caused to you, um, guilt that you've, about things you've done, maybe even shame, None of those things stop God liking you. They, they may stop you liking yourself, but if God likes you, then maybe you can begin to like yourself because things he likes and loves are things that we should like and love. Maybe you think about yourself and you think, well, if the person sitting next to me, yeah, e even if that's your husband or your wife who knows an awful lot about you, if they knew that some of the thoughts that went through your head some of the time, you, you might think perhaps they wouldn't like me so much or wouldn't love me so much. But the truth this morning is that no matter what your thoughts are, no matter what's inside your heart, God loves you. He loves you because he loves you. He doesn't love you for what you do. He doesn't love you for what you say or what you think. He loves you because he loves you. He created you. He knows you intimately. And Sometimes the thing that stops us drawing close to God is not that God is surprised or, or disappointed in who we are. It's because we're disappointed in who we are and we withdraw from him rather than drawing close to him. And, and if this morning's message just helps you to draw a bit closer to God in that way, um, then I feel that God will have done a work through me this morning. So let's look then at these first six verses. For the sake of time, I, I won't read them again, but um, if you've got them open in front of you, that would be really, really helpful. It starts off with this verse 1 where we, we see that God's knowledge of us is personal and penetrating. The, the word there, search, just gives this idea, this sense that, that, that that's, God takes a great deal of care to examine us and to understand us. Jewish people could, could use this word to describe digging in a mine, exploring a land, investigating, investigating a legal case. It, it's, it's doing all the groundwork that needs to be done to make sure you understand the situation. And God has done that. He knows you absolutely intimately and in the greatest detail. He knows all that we do. He knows our every action. So in verses Two to four, we read about him knowing when we sit down and when we rise. He knows our thoughts. He knows um, when we lie down and when we go to sleep and when we get up, and get up in the morning. All the things in your daily life that seem so mundane and ordinary. He knows what you had for breakfast. And he's interested. I mean, the person next to you probably isn't, but, but God is interested in what you had for breakfast. That's just mind-blowing, isn't it? 
I mean, maybe some of you have already forgotten what you had for breakfast. I don't know. Or maybe you have the same thing every morning. But, but God is interested in every small detail. He knows everywhere you go. He knows every location you're in. He's not surprised at the situations and circumstances you find yourself in. Nothing is hidden from his sight. And then in verse 5, we, we read these words about him hemming us in behind and before, and he lays his hand upon us. And what we, we see here is that um, he not only knows us, but he's actually looking out for us to do his best for us. This idea of hemming in seems to me to, to speak of a sense of protection. And, and there are times when we, we feel unprotected, don't we? We feel vulnerable, we feel alone, and we wonder where God might be. Many of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the footprints poem that, that talks about a person walking along the beach and there's two sets of footprints in the sand. And then as they look back, they can see at times there's only one. And the individual turns to God and says, well, where were you in those times? And God says, my son, my, my daughter, those were the times when I carried you. God is there protecting us, even when we don't realize it. Even when it doesn't seem like it, he's there protecting us. And then the final verse of this section, verse 6, says this. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. I don't know about you, but to understand that God knows me that intimately, that completely, that complete acceptance of who I am is just mind-blowing. It is staggering that the God of the universe, who is so powerful, who's, who's able to fling stars and planets and galaxies into space, would be that interested in me. And he is. He is that interested in us. And David's response is, I'm not equal to this. And it's almost a, an expression of worship at the God who we worship, who we love. And then we move into verses 7 and 12. You see, knowledge like that can be seen in one of two ways. It can be seen as something really comforting and really um, encouraging and uplifting and makes us feel really secure. Or it can make you feel terrified. I had a re recurring dream when I was a teenager um, I haven't had it for many, many years, but I would dream in, in the middle of the night that there was this great big hand, which I took to be God, coming down to, to crush me. And, and because I knew, and I was wrestling in my heart with things I knew weren't right, and it felt like that, that God couldn't like me, couldn't love me because of who, who I was. And there was a sense in which I wanted to run away. And many people want to run away from God. And in this psalm, David actually talks about this idea of running away from God. He, he, he says, um, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? It, it, is, it, it could be for some people, even this morning sitting here, it could be that actually, far from being encouraging and comforting to know God knows you like that, you're thinking, if God knows me like that, I am exposed. I, I'm, I've got nowhere to, to hide. At, but I want to. I don't, I don't feel I should be in the presence of a holy God, a righteous God. And David explores this and unpacks it. In verse, um, verse 8, he talks about, um, if I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down and make my bed in the depths, you are there. It, that's in the NIV translation. In older translations, it's a little bit more clear that we're talking about, if I go to heaven where God is, I can't escape from him there. And if I was to go to hell, I can't escape from God there. Now that's a bit surprising, isn't it? Because, I mean, God lives in heaven, so clearly to, to go to the heavens to try and escape from him, that would, be, that would be mad because we would find him there. But actually, David is indicating to us that there is a sense in which God is present even in hell. Now, before you think I've turned into a complete heretic, what I, I want to say here is that that is a place where, for some people, it's a place of terror. The presence of God produces different effects in these places, but he's unquestionably in each. The bliss of one, the terror of another. What an awful thought that some men seem resolved to take up their night's abode in hell, 
a night that know no morning. Nevertheless, it's also a comfort for us to know that during those times when it feels like we're going through hell on earth, God is also there with us. I meet people in the hospital and honestly, to them, their life feels like a hell. Maybe this morning, you're going through circumstances in your life and you're thinking, could hell be any worse than this? And it's a comfort to know, isn't it, that in that place, God will be there and come alongside you. But David then talks in verse 9 about rising on the wings of the dawn and settling on the far side of the sea. And, and he now brings us back down to the, to the earthly realm, to the geographical places that we live. And again, it doesn't matter where we find ourselves. In the, in the darkest of places, God is there. His spirit is with us. If we were writing this psalm now, we might change the language slightly. And in an age of space travel, where we're billionaires and film stars going to space, we, we might say, if I took a spaceship to the Father's galaxies, even there your spirit would be with me. There is no physical place in all of creation that we can escape from the Spirit of God. And then verse 10, in a little bit of an echo of verse 5, we read, David says, even though your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. You see, this presence of God's Spirit being with us wherever we go is meant to be, for us, a place of security. It is meant to be, for us, a place of safety. Paul writing um, in the New Testament, um, in um, Romans, says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. This knowledge that God has about us is not to condemn us, but to set us free. It's, it's not to, to wear us down, but actually to give us life. And then the last two verses of this section, we read about the darkness. Surely the darkness will hide me, the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. We might hide in the darkness, but it will not hide us, and it will not overwhelm us. In John chapter 3, um, after the famous verse, For God so loved the world, we read these. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly and that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. People, it's a characteristic of people who do evil that they want to hide in the darkness but their deeds will be exposed. But it's characteristic of those people who've received the mercy of and love of Christ, which makes us righteous in his sight, that we want to bring things out into the light and live in the light. And even if we're going through dark times, again, we can take comfort here that he will make the darkness shine like the noonday sun. Moving on to the, the third section. God made us wonderfully, we cannot ignore him. We come now to one of the greatest passages in literature about the miracle of human conception at birth. Eugene Peterson says, in the presence of birth, we don't calculate, we marvel. And if you've ever had that privilege of holding a newborn baby in your arms and just looked at how perfect you know, their fingernails are and their hands and their toes and, and every part of their body is, is, a, is, a, is a miniature version of, a, of an adult but it all works completely and perfectly and it just blows your mind away. I, I've got a photograph of me looking at my granddaughter, first granddaughter when she was born and you can just see the kind of amazement and wonder. And although I've got two daughters, it's just a grandchild somehow, it was just a fresh and, and, and sparkled in a new kind of a way. And, and in these verses we, we see that God is intimately evolved. Right from the moment of conception, each new child in the womb is an act of God's creation. We see that uh, 
even the, the photographs that we sometimes see of an unborn baby, which is just so stunningly beautiful and so complete as we see the development of, of, of the egg into a fetus, into an embryo, into uh, a baby who's about to be born. It just blows our minds away to see the beauty of that. It points to the fact that each child is there by the will of God and, and is under his care and protection and love. And it doesn't matter what are the circumstances around that conception. And, and I want to touch on a difficult topic here because um, even when a child isn't planned or maybe is the result of, of violence that that child has been conceived, that child is important to God. That child is planned by God. That child is loved by God. That child is under his control and guardianship. And, and I know that even raising this subject for some of you may raise pain because um, of the circumstances of your life. We know that there are thousands of children who are terminated each year through abortion and it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for the child. It's a tragedy also for the mother and father involved. And there are many who carry guilt and live with long-term regret when they choose this path. And it's, it's not our place this morning. Please hear me on this. It's not my place this morning. It's not our place to add condemnation and judgmentalism, add a burden on top of that. But actually what these verses should help us to do is to show compassion and love and support for, for these people. God's intentionality and intimate involvement in the conception, the very start of human life, means to me that I can't believe he would abandon an innocent child who doesn't make it to adulthood. We can be confident that these lives that have ended before they've been gone, for whatever reason, will be caught up in his loving arms. Do you remember, you may remember the story of David and Bathsheba and how David sees Bathsheba and commits adultery with her and then Bathsheba is pregnant and she gives birth to a son. And David's sin is exposed by the prophet. Um, and shortly after the son is born, the, son, the boy takes sick and dies. And, and while the boy is sick, David is praying and fasting and calling on God to have mercy and to heal his son. But when the baby dies, we read these words in 2 Samuel. It says this, his attendants came and asked him, why are you acting in this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now the child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. I believe these words and the words in this psalm give us encouragement. The babies give us hope. The babies who are miscarried, babies who are stillborn, babies who die in infancy are welcomed into the arms of our Heavenly Father. And, and what I want to say to you is, you know, if what I've touched on here this morning um, has caused you pain, that's not been my intention to cause pain, but my intention has been to give you hope. But I realise that in two minutes, in a, in a sermon of 25, 30 minutes, I can't deal adequately with this subject. I'd encourage you to reach out to those who can help. There's the SAFE in Basingstoke who provide a service for mothers and fathers and, and people caught up in, in the pain of difficult pregnancies and crisis. And, and they would be able to help you. There'll be people in this church who you can turn to, who can direct you to them or provide you with support um, if you need that support. Moving quickly on, because I see that time is, is running away from me. Um, in verse 14, we see that um, David says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. His, his understanding of the, the beauty and intricacy of human life causes him to worship God and, and can cause us to worship God. In verse 16, he, he talks about how all the days um, ordained for us are written in his book. Do you, do you, do you get that? You know, right from the moment you were conceived, all the way through your gestation, all the way through your, your childhood, your schooling, your, your, your work life, right the way through into your retirement years, 
and then to the point when you die. That's, that's the typical trajectory. I know we don't all follow that completely, but God knows every single one of those. I believe with all my heart that not a single person dies a day earlier, a day late in God's economy. Now that is difficult. You know, that, that MP that was stabbed this last week was doing so much good. Um, it is, um, you know, it seems to us like he's ended, his life has ended prematurely, but I believe in God's economy, he understands that and knew all about that. He's not surprised or taken out um, by, he, 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 he knows every single one of our days. And he's given us those days as an opportunity for us to live out the things he's prepared for us. In Ephesians it says that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works he's prepared for us in advance to do. We don't do good things to earn God's favour, but because of his grace and mercy which gives us this eternal life, we're then set free to do good things which he's prepared for us to do. And part of the, the challenge and excitement of life is to find out what those things might be. Someone has said that God's faithful children are immortal until their work is done. And I think there's some truth in that. And then the end of this um, section, um, David says, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. It echoes a little bit the end of section one where he said such knowledge is too wonderful for me God's thoughts outnumber the grains of sand you know, in this, this psalm we see or begin to glimpse something of the enormity and majesty of God's knowledge of us and his thoughts we begin to start to think God's thoughts after him and we start to realize, and David realizes this, he can't number them. You can't number the grains of sand. You start to realize that God's thoughts are way, way beyond ours. But they're precious. They are, they're valuable. They are beyond some. And um, when we're awake, he's with us. Let's move now to the, the last section, verses 19 through to 24. I don't know about you, but I find these first few verses in this section really difficult. I find it difficult that um, David would say, if only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. They, your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? Um, there are many parts of the Psalms, and I read them and I think, how did that get in the Bible? Because that doesn't seem like the God I know. It doesn't seem like the sort of thing that you should say in church. <laughs> but it's there because it's real. And it's how we feel. And I, I draw so... And I've seen... I mean, there have been times when I've skipped that verse. And I know many of us, we skip those verses when we read this psalm. Because it, it's not nice in the context of everything else we've read. But it's there. It's part of God's scripture. It's inspired by God. And it's there for a purpose. And it's there for a purpose because it does remind us there is a reality that God will one day judge all people. And God's judgment is right and just. And we will understand that to be right and just in that day. In this present life, we don't always see justice. We read and hear in the news of, of things that have happened and it seems like there's no real justice for the people who've done these wicked things. And, and somehow in our heart, we feel like there ought to be righteousness, there ought to be justice. And so, even if we don't feel like we should say it in church, I think actually we should, but even if we don't feel like that, that those thoughts are there, and it's somehow instinctive within everybody that we want to see justice. What our measure of justice might vary, but, but God is the ultimate arbiter of what is just and what is right, and he will, on that final day, bring justice, and everyone Whichever side of the divide they fall, whether they go to be with Christ for eternity in the new heaven and the new earth, or whether they are condemned to this place of destruction that we call hell, they will agree that God's judgment was right and just. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer and say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in part that's what we're praying for, is that God will bring his justice to bear in the world and universe that he's created. And so... Actually, for us to align ourselves with that 
and to say, because I love you, God, and because I'm so amazed at the wonder of what you've created and your deep, intense love for every single person on this planet, and I know that you sent Jesus to die so that every single person has the opportunity to come into the, the, the security of your grace and mercy. I can also pray that, that on that right day that your judgment will be seen to do right for those who've chosen to reject you and haven't turned to the Father. And then the last two verses also seem a little strange, don't they? Because it says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We've had 20-odd verses where we've heard and seen how intimately God knows about us. And now we say, God, search me and know me. But he, he already knows us and has already searched us. What's going on here? Well, what's happening here is that, yes, God does know us intimately, but the place that he wants us to come to is we say, well, God, you know everything about me. I want to lay myself open before you and not try and hide from you. I, I, I want to allow your, your gaze to look upon me and expose in me those dark thoughts. When Jesus was talking about um, loving your neighbour, he, he said, you know, if, if someone hates their brother, it's as good as murder. If someone looks lustfully at a woman, it's like committing adultery. What's going on in our heads, in our hearts, is, is as important in God's eyes as the actual things we do. And, and God wants us to be completely transparent before him. It's really the act of repentance. It's saying, I agree that, that the things I've done, the things I've thought, the things I've said, my attitudes and motives, you already know what they are, and I agree with you that they are um, against your will and bring you pain. But I also believe that you have offered me forgiveness and will lead me in the way everlasting. In 1 John 1 verse 9 we read, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And those words are written, again, in the context of, of living in the light and walking in the light. It's only as we allow ourselves to be truly known by God and not hide away from him or try to hide away from him that we receive these promises that we will know security, will know his comfort, will know his peace. So as we come to a conclusion, I want to invite you, we're going to um, um, play another song which may well not be known to you. It's called Lord You Have Searched Me. It's by Joel Payne. And as we either join in with the song if you know it, but if you don't, just maybe sit and allow this song to minister to you. Allow the Holy Spirit to help you reflect on the words of this psalm. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister forgiveness and mercy and grace into your life, if that's where you're at. If you are in a place of struggle, allow these words to encourage you and strengthen you that God is with you in this situation. And at the end of the meeting, if you've been affected by what I've said and would like some prayer, then I'll stay at the front and by all means come and speak to me and I'm happy to pray for you and I guess there are others here this morning who you can also talk to and pray. But let's join together um, as we finish our worship time by using this song together. Who else could ever have knowledge 
like this So high and so wonderful Where can I go from the spirit? Where can I free from your presence? If I go up to the heavens You are there You are there If I go deeper than oceans Will rise on the wings of If I thought darkness would hide me Shielding my ways from your sight Even the night would be bright as the day The darkness would shine with your light Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We hope you've enjoyed the service and have been blessed by all that you have seen and heard. Uh, just a few reflections on what David has shared with us. God knows you. Jesus, his son, knows you. We don't need to feel lost. And God gives us his special peace. Um, I'm going to just read a verse from Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 this is from the amplified version i like the amplified version because of the extra explanatory bits it offers it says you will keep him in perfect and constant peace the one whose mind is steadfast that is committed and focused on you in both inclination and character because he trusts in you and takes refuge in you with hope and confident expectation. That message of peace is actually echoed on the banner outside, which you'll probably notice as you leave today. John 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. My prayer today is that God's peace may go with you all this week. We would love for you to come back and join us again next week. You would all be most welcome. 
So God bless and have a great week.